Uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com backslash events. And if you don't already do, uh, don't already do so, please follow us on the social, social medias such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and on our YouTube channel. Tonight, we are very excited to welcome Laura Moulton in conversation with Omar Elakab. In 2011, Laura Moulton founded Street Books, a bicycle-powered lending library serving folks living outside in Portland, Oregon. That summer, Ben Hodson became one of her most dedicated regulars, setting the still unbeaten single season record for borrowing. Then winter came and Ben's routines changed and they didn't see each other for two years. Loners, the making of a street library is the story they began to tell when they reconnected. Their story is a lot of things. It's an oral history of a friendship told in hyper observant vignettes. It's a much needed report from the front lines of Portland's housing crisis. It's a DIY guide to creating your own street library. It's an indelible portrait of what it's like to experience houselessness for three and a half years. It's an unforgettable exercise in empathy. And also, it's very funny. Hoxson, or Hodge, as Laura calls him, is a classic raconteur, and Moulton matches him tail for tail. Loners alternates between their perspectives in an addictively readable, occasionally sublime way. Moulton will be joined in conversation by Omar el -Akad. Omar is the author of the new novel, What Strange Paradise, and the award-winning novel, American War. What Strange Paradise was just shortlisted this morning for the Giller Prize. So big congratulations to Omar on that. And if you've seen him interview uh, other authors at any events, you know he's one of the best at it, uh, doing that as well. We thank Omar for being part of tonight's event. This event includes an audience Q&A. If you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button. And uh, if someone has typed a question that you'd like to know the answer to, you can upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up. Most importantly, please support Laura and Powell's by purchasing a copy of the new book from us, a link to buy loners as well as a link to buy Omar's books will be shared a couple of times this evening in the chat. Laura, Omar, so excited to welcome you both. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with Laura, um, who in addition to being an exceptional writer, is somebody who has made this town better. Um, I think that's about as straightforward a way as I can, I can put that. Um, this book, if you haven't read it yet, it's one of the very few that I swept through in a day. Um, and it joins the ranks of uh, a very select group of books that I think it's gonna, it's gonna sound silly to say, but just tell you how it is. Um, it is, there's an element of honesty in this book um, that, I, that I wish I could capture in my own writing. It's an exceptional piece of work. It's an honor to be here with Laura. I have a ton of questions that I will happily set aside. If you all have questions, put them in the Q and A and I will put yours ahead of mine. Um, Laura, before we start, before I dig into this, do you want to give us uh, a short reading and then we'll we'll get into the book? Yeah, thank you, Omar. I want to thank Powell's uh, for hosting this event and for Kevin for that great introduction. Um, and Omar, who is such a, a sought after conversation partner and interviewer, I'm really honored he would lend his uh, time and talent with to us uh, tonight. And I do want to just uh, speak at the top of the hour to Hodge's absence. Um, he has been unwell this past month and it was my most genuine hope that he would be able to be here tonight and that did not happen. Um, but we are hoping uh, for an in-person event at the Portland Book Festival and that would be a conversation with um, Karen Russell. So fingers crossed and we're, we're really looking forward to that. Um, I wanna just read uh, a little sample from the book and I'm gonna start with a short um, part of one of my vignettes. And this is told, for those of you who haven't looked at the book yet, 
in kind of alternating vignettes uh, between Hodge Hodge and myself. And um, this is sort of the very first shift that I was out there. So I'll read um, two small vignettes from myself and one from Hodge. I confess I was nervous. What if nobody out here wanted a book? There was also a small voice in me that said, really, a book? Somebody's been sleeping on a piece of cardboard on the concrete for months and what you're going to offer is a paperback? It had occurred to me that a person who had been on the road for months or years might not enjoy reading The Grapes of Wrath. My first patron wasn't a patron at all, but a security guard named A.B. He studied my contraption, scanned the titles in the library, and then asked for my permit. I don't think I need a permit if I'm not selling anything, I told him. He chewed on this information for a few minutes, circled the bike, and then shrugged. He rested his hand on the edge of the bike box and settled into a comfortable lean. I get notions to read stuff, he said, like books about secret government doings and everything that we're not supposed to know. But he said he rarely finished a book before getting distracted on account of his busy brain. Just when I began to wonder if his uniformed presence at the library might hurt my business, he wished me luck and pushed off. With A.B. gone, I screwed up my courage and approached the group of young people sprawled on the grass. Hey, I'm, oh, I'm operating a library for people living outside. You should come have a look at the books if you like. I handed out a street books card to each person. Thomas was one of the first from the group to amble over and inspect my collection. Up close, I saw that he had sea blue eyes that were both spooky and beautiful, and his chin and neck were tattooed with dark blue designs. I take requests if you have any, I said. He studied me for a minute. I've been meaning to read Cold Mountain by Charles Frazier. Whatever I might have supposed about a young man wearing mostly black with tattoos on his face and neck and gauges in his ears, it wasn't that he'd been meaning to read a retelling of the Odyssey set during the American Civil War. I realized I needed to keep my mind open and make no assumptions about what a patron might want to read or about who they were. Nothing was a given. Each person was a walking secret history. It was up to them how much they revealed. And I just have one more small part um, from my perspective and then I'll finish with Hodge. The second shift. The next week it was still misty and cool as I set the library up alongside Skidmore Fountain. There were police officers on horses posing for pictures with a gaggle of elementary school children. One kid could not get over the horses and kept reaching up as if to hug one around the neck over the protestations of his teacher. After the students lined up and followed their teacher away, the officers roused a row of people along the fountain where they slept, hedged in by shopping carts covered in blue tarp, a tangle of clothing and bedding and arms. I watched as they groggily assembled their belongings. A young man in white stocking feet stared blankly at the bike library and then went back to stuffing his gear into a plastic bag. My first customer of the day was a man wearing red horn-rimmed glasses and a beard on the edge of feral. His hair grew just past his collar and were he to trade his shabby gray coat for a tweed jacket and his brown paper bag for a leather briefcase, it would have been easy enough to imagine him at the lectern of a university classroom. By now the sun had burned off the mist and the day was warm. Come have a look at these books, I said. I'm running a free library. You check them out and then return them the next week, same time, same place. And I'll end with this section. GQ, this is Hodge. At first she looked like any other street librarian, complete with the cards and the books and the post-it notes and paper clips. Bicycle parked and little shelf pulled out displaying the collection. I graciously overlooked the complete lack of any Woodhouse titles on her shelves but did mention in passing that a well-maintained library does require some attention. Only too late would I learn that here was a teacher turned recalcitrant school child that refuses to do her assigned reading, but I didn't know that yet. I'd arrived in my ratty looking coat, scruffy beard, hair going every which way, like I'd just stepped off the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly and then into the threshing machine. The way I must have looked to Laura at the street library it could easily have been straight out of Woodhouse. Describing one of Bertie's lovesick acquaintances, he writes, he looked like a character in one of those Russian novels trying to decide whether to murder several relatives before hanging himself in the barn. 
This is such a fantastic book. Um, I wanted to ask you about the structure. Um, so you, you've read a couple of your sections and one of Ben's sections. Um, that's sort of how it, how it alternates throughout the vast majority of the book is it sort of goes back and forth in somewhat chronological order. We start at the beginning of sort of how this started out as a project for you, fairly small scale, and then the expansion and, and how you came to know Ben. Um, the writing styles are very different. There's a section in there that's a transcript of a voicemail message. Uh, there's an instruction manual in there. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how you decided on this particular structure and the challenges of trying to make it work when you've got two authors writing in two very different styles, um, two different perspectives on the, on the same, same topic? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I think one of the, the daunting things, and I think sometimes one of the, the reasons it took Hodge and I quite a while to finally finish it was um, when we sat down to try to put everything together, it, it was partly a reconstruction of this past. And I had notes in my little notebook that I had kept at each shift. And so I actually had a remarkably uh, accurate and detailed twice weekly story from, the, from downtown Portland um, but it was of it was composed of what people checked out, and it was composed of the conversations that I had. So I was able to lean on that sort of to construct that. Um, Hodge, I think, um, had these wonderful stories, and I think his mode of composition um, was often to think about uh, a story so that by the time he wrote it down, it was kind of perfect. I think that that that's a sense I get in his composing that. Um, he'd sort of sat with it and, and revised it internally for so long that when it went down on the page, it was a pretty clean um, piece of writing. And so I think that um, part of the challenge was reaching back and trying to reconstruct periods of time where we didn't know what the other was doing and we um, hadn't been in touch. Um, I also think a lot about how I had two ki little kids at home. I was trying to run the street library. I was kind of teaching on the side and forever I thought if I just pulled it together and was organized once and for all, this thing would finish itself. And of course, that's ridiculous when trying to pull together a book project. And in the end, we were so lucky with the people that came in at very important times and, and supported us um, in the writing. So I would say structurally fragments kind of work for us. You know, I think that that was the way um, the assembly took, took shape. I'm curious about the the sort of you know you, a lot of this is is you at the ground level sort of doing this work and at an individual level one of the sort of the, the the things that you come back to either implicitly or towards the end of the book in this instruction manual explicitly is this notion that one of the things you definitely never do is make assumptions about the human beings who are coming and and looking at these books and I'm, I'm wondering how difficult a piece of advice that is to take and whether you still find yourself in a situation where you run afoul of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that that it's partly part of, re of sharing that that several different times I realized that I have come into a thing fancying that I was quite open minded or that I had this, um, you know, expansive view of, of humanity and nothing could surprise me, but I think all the time I am forced to revisit what I might've assumed or what I didn't realize, it's so internal that I didn't realize I was carrying it into a situation or to an interaction, you know? And so I think that that is, you know, I think that I think a lot about um, former students like a Lewis and Clark student who did an outing and a tour with Hodge in Old Town and after that, he kept saying, I just keep thinking about Hodge. And whenever I see people now walking, like with a shopping cart or outdoors, I think, what if they're like Hodge? What if they're as funny and as, you know, human? And I, I think, of course they are, you know, and, and, that's, and that's one of the lessons. But, but I think that that is something, um, maybe that's a human condition, like constant, um, you know, revising what we thought about a situation or we assumed. So yeah, that's definitely been a compelling kind of impulse for sure. And it, a lot of the things that Ben writes about there, there there's, 
I mean, one of the things that struck me about his sections is this idea that whenever the system or any one of these systems that we have essentially structured our society around or agents of these systems show up and have an interaction with them, a lot of times it seemed to me that his expectation was not so much, is this person going to hassle me or not hassle me, but rather, is this person going to be decent about it when they hassle me or not? And that kind of expectation that if anything comes from the direction of the system, it's not so much good or bad, it's degrees of, of how bad that's going to be. I'm wondering from your perspective of years of doing this work, how frustrating it is to be in this position where you're talking to human beings and you're getting to know them while all around you, there are systems and agents of these systems that are almost predicated on not knowing who these people are. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is something that occurred to me and I capture this in the book, that very first outing, I realized, wow, I've been conditioned to avoid people who are having a crisis, who are sitting on a piece of cardboard. Um, and so I think that that's real. I also think Portland is a unique city and like, like there have been part of the trouble, part of the enduring um, unwieldy situation that we have where so many people are outdoors has to do with um, various kinds of um, pushes and pulls and advocacy by many different groups and, um, and that are doing work on the ground. And, and, and then also at the city politics level too, it's just sort of an unwieldy mess right now. But, but I do have the sense that people are actively engaged in um, helping or in getting to know their neighbors in a much more um, interesting way, I think, than some other cities that are still kind of grappling with it. But I, I just mean that that's in the neighbor, in the, it's in the, um, in the form of like Sunnyside uh, Neighborhood Association that, that came together and put together a shower program for people that were living outdoors. And that was after people were displaced from Sunnyside Park to Laurelhurst Park and back to Laurelhurst Park, not with any solution or any place to go, but they just could no longer be there. And so um, I'm hugely uh, inspired by the work that I'm seeing every day um, you know, on the streets. But I also think, and I always feel like, this might be just an optimist in me, but I always feel like the people that, um, you know, write mean comments like homeless people should be ground up into hamburger and fed uh, in school lunches or whatever, early stuff that we got, like trolls that we got when we first started getting newspaper coverage. I feel like those guys just haven't met patrons yet, or they just haven't had an opportunity. Like they're one encounter away from realizing, oh, okay, that's a really interesting person. And I think one of my motivating factor, you know, impulses when this started was like, there's a guy that lived in a wheelchair down under a bridge, but he also checked out Thomas Pinchon from the library. And I thought if people can see this guy with a picture of Pinchon, which I've never been able to finish a book of, maybe that will revive, that will help them. And so that was the, that was the, the photos of the patrons with their books. That was also kind of a, a part of that, like telling that, telling a different kind of story from the streets, you know? I think one of the things that, that stuck with me, probably, I mean, there's a lot of parts of this book that I love, but I think the part that stuck with me the most were these moments of sort of serendipitous joy. Um, I'm thinking here of the one patron who shows up and mentions an interest, I think it was in organic gardening. And so you managed to hunt down a book on organic gardening. This person doesn't show up for years and years and years. And then years later, you're looking for someone to help you get this bike off. The, and it's this person and you still have the book. Um, I, I, I suppose this is the, 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 the most broad question you could possibly be asked. And I apologize in advance, but I have to ask it. But you have, how does the experience of doing this work change you? How has it changed your life, your, your, your perspective on the world? Oh man, that's such a good question. I mean, I guess, I think Hodge speaks way more eloquent, eloquently to this than I could. And it's that idea of um, random kindnesses and what you see. I mean, we, you know, at a street library, you witness people in true crisis and you might see some things sometimes that are like the worst uh, parts of people. Um, like like the 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 day they're not their best selves, like they're least their best selves that day. But you also, you know, we see um, 
like a young kid that's just coming from having punched someone or having had a scuffle, but he still wants to catch the library before we close up, you know? And I just think those, maybe that's the lingering, um, the lingering thing is just um, that sense that those two things exist together. Like there is a beautiful thing that just happened in, a, in the street and there's also a really hard thing. And those are intertwined. And, and also, I mean, just the gift of being outside several times a week uh, in our city for more than a decade. Like that's a crazy thing I would never have signed up to do uh, without this project. And that, that's been a really cool thing. And I, it, it gives me, I, you know, I, I wrote about this in the, in the blog post that's on Powell's um, this week, just that idea that um, the city has so much happening and it's, there are tragic rough spots right now. And there are also these gorgeous, you know, afternoons where someone opens an umbrella for someone. And, you know, um, it's, so it's really an interesting thing. It's been a real gift. Um, I'm starting to see questions show up in the Q&A. Uh, thank you for posting those. I promise I will get to them. And if you have more, put them in there. I will not, I will not let them go. Um, before I do that, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit just about the prescriptive element of this book and, and obviously of the work that you do. Um, there is a section here on, on how to start your own street library. It's very much an instruction manual uh, at the end of this book. Um, I'm wondering what is the sort of central piece of advice you give to folks who are trying to do this in their own cities? And I mean, we have people in the chat right now who are, who are running their own uh, street books uh, systems and, and libraries and, and what you've learned from them, what you've learned from interacting. So what is, what is the piece of advice that is most central to your work and what have you learned from folks who are doing this elsewhere? Oh man, I guess, you know, one of the, one of the biggest uh, suggestions I would have is maybe just a, the same suggestion I would have for how to go about one's life, which is just to arrive with curiosity to a place and a situation. And if, if you see something in your city that is alarming, don't assume that there aren't a number of networks trying valiantly already to treat the situation. I think it's easy to sweep in with a good noble idea and say, I am here to you know, affect change. But in fact, um, being really mindful of what might be happening already and then really tuned in to folks that the other part is just not crowding someone who is experiencing hardship. And just because you have a gift or something to bring doesn't mean they're interested in having a conversation with you. And I think those are really key first steps to just being very mindful of a place and very curious. Who's been coming here already? What services are offered? Uh, would it be interesting uh, you know, to have the addition of books or to have the addition of this project? You know, um, And just really forging ties and um, um, making, you know, making bonds, making a community before launching into anything, um, I think would be a pretty important consideration. I was, I was fascinated by a lot of the conversations that you end up having and that end up just sort of happening around this, this mini ecosystem. Um, there was the one person who showed up with a, a conception of compressed time, talking about how the years were compressed within the years. So even though they've been gone for two years, it actually was six and a half. And it's this fascinating conversation. I sort of had to put the book down for a second and start to think about this. And my mind went off in all kinds of different directions. Um, how frequently did you sort of consult your, your, your notes before this project? And, and when you did go to consult them for the book project, how, how much did it bring back? And what kind of an experience was it to go back and, and think about all of these conversations and experiences that you had over the years? Oh man, that's such a good question. You know, I think my prevailing for maybe like six years or something, my prevailing sense was um, when I would ride my bike home from downtown, I would think I would never capture what just happened. You know, there was this sense like that, if, if only I was the kind of writer that could capture what exquisite thing just unfolded in a cityscape. And, um, and so I think that I had that sense. And then of course, in the end, we have to get around that stupid limitation and write the best that we can do. And we know that it will never be as brilliant as the thing we just saw, but we have to do it. And so 
that was the other probably wedge and you know slow down for my own process. Um, but I would say it was in, I've been a lifelong journal keeper since maybe I was 16 or 17. And I think that um, those notes and that record um, turns out to be a pretty invaluable um, you know, resource uh, to look back on and, and um, refer to. But also I think when you, it is in a way like I've had a conversation with myself all along. Like I had this um, tunnel that I'd created unwittingly by, by creating this flow, by documenting each day so that it wasn't as hard to pull together these you know, uh, pieces as I thought it would be, you know. This is, this is purely a book nerd question. I apologize in advance, but I'm wondering, um, A, sort of what the process of acquiring, how many different forms that process, and you talk about a lot of this in the book, just the many different ways in which you got stuck for that. And also whether there was sort of a white whale, if there was ever something that a patron asked for, you just thought, you know, this translation of A Thousand and One Nights, what are you talking about? Like what, what the difficulty level, what, what had a degree of difficulty? Well, that's funny. I'm not sure that this answers your question altogether, but I do remember a day where Hodge called me and said, Laura, you're gonna love this. Today's shift, the guy turned down Goethe, not because he didn't want to read Goethe, but because he didn't care for the translation we had, you know? Huh. And I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, but you know, in terms of, um, with like with regard to putting this whole thing together, um, when I reconnected with Hodge and we document this in the book, uh, we started to have a coffee together every week at this um, cafe in, in Old Town. And he was still outdoors for a period of that time and then gradually got, got inside. And we began to just have a conversation, like what would it be like to have you work for street books? He began to be sort of inventory specialist and help us uh, with sorting books. And um, eventually I wrote a couple grants, one I didn't get, I don't even remember what it was for. And I think it was probably great that we didn't get it. But then um, Regional Arts and Culture Council gave us a grant to do a literary project together. And that was a really important step for taking ourselves seriously. We um, started meeting at the um, library branch on Killingsworth and, and having a session, a real regular session. And we began to compile pieces that way. And one of the interesting things was we would work in kind of fits and starts. So there were times when we were deep in it and exchanging small pieces. And then I was trying to put them sort of together in order. And we got a, an email from a German documentary crew um, in Munich that said they wanted to come follow street books. So they came to Portland, they followed us, they made a beautiful documentary. But one of the things that they were really excited about was to hear that we were writing this book. But at the time, it was a good solid six months since Hodge and I had really earnestly worked on this. We had this you know, manuscript that hadn't gone anywhere. So we actually had to sort of perform editing on this documentary. They, they said, can we, can we film your editing process? And we were like, uh, okay. So we had this awkward pretending to edit the thing that we had not worked on for a while. So that, that's an example of like an experience that maybe lit a fire under us because we had then a volunteer, Alyssa Hatman, who is a professor, writing professor and editor, who stepped in and said, if you ever need any help, I'd love to help. And she was great in the pandemic hit, it was quiet. And then um, Michael Heald from Perfect Day, who is such a meticulous editor, stepped forward. And I have to say, Michael in the end was hugely instrumental in looking at what we had, because I really did hand him, maybe with my nose even kind of plugged, Will you please look at this because we have no idea what it is anymore. And I think we owe a, a debt to Alyssa and to Michael for seeing in a, in a better way, in a clearer way than we could, uh, what, we, what it might be, you know? So it was a hugely humbling thing in a way too, because it, it took so much more and so many more caring people to make a book, to make a good book than I would have ever known. And so I'm so grateful, you know? One of the things that I, I think about a lot, I mean, with respect to my own work as a journalist before I became a novelist, but also as a novelist because of the subject matter I write about, is this notion of how you approach a temporary state of being in someone else's space, which 
feels to me like a lot of this project where you are temporarily in this space, but then you leave and, and sort of, I was curious about how you think about that, that, particularly with the construction of something like the documentary crew that came over or this book, where there's going to be now a permanent archive or a permanent sort of document of this experience that on one side is somebody's life, somebody's permanent life, and on the other side is your sort of temporary space. I'm wondering how you think about that and how it influences what and how you choose to write. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I love, I've always thought of the, the bike library as this kind of cool intersection that we just, you know, almost like a, I don't know. Anyway, it's just, it's like an intersection that we create and, and you have to in, engage with it because you either have to walk a, a wide berth if you don't want anything to do with it. It's too weird. Oh, it's that lady again with all the books or you walk past it and, you know, have to engage. And so creating that space and then having people, ah, oh, here's the library, there's the book library. Having people come has, has been such a cool part of that project. Um, and I also think that um, I'm highly, I'm so aware of power differentials, like, like um, power imbalance with regard to people who are taking part in the project and then might get, get invited to have their picture taken, for example, or I was very protective of patrons when a camera crew wanted to come in and I would not connect them with anyone that I didn't know very well that hadn't been part of the project unless there was a passerby or people gathered that were game to be a part of, of that experience. And I have changed, in fact, as a street books kind of policy, we've changed um, taking pictures of people. I mean, we've, we've, uh, we've changed that up. We have to know someone very well before we'll use their photo in case there's any question about what they're volunteering for, you know, just just given um, the way people are vulnerable, you know. I mean, you talk about the idea of the sort of changing policy around and, and sort of, I would imagine, best practices and thinking about it in those terms. We're talking about a project that started as a very, very small scale endeavor and has since gone on to have many volunteers and a board and um, a sort of governance structure that that is 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 vastly bigger in scope than what was at the very beginning there. Um, how often are there sort of disagreements, sort of policy disagreements, ideological disagreements? Can you give me a, a sort of a, the, the insider's experience of what the process of, of governance is like? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I have to say, I, I started this as a three-month art project. And so the idea of like administering a nonprofit was always very, I think it was like three years of us kind of laughing when I was referred to as an executive director because that just sounded far fancier than any of us really felt. Um, and I think over time we have um, we have felt like we were scrappy and like we were renegade a little bit. We were outside of the mainstream, um, but we've also benefited hugely from the support of Portland and of foundations and things like that. And so, in terms of like um, you know debates, sometimes it's been like how part how much how much can we be advocates and work you know, on this campaign or this sort of thing and still be purely a street library that focuses on people living outside. You know, I mean, we've had to cope with all the things that I think nonprofits probably cope with, which is we see a hole that we'd like to fix. Well, we can fix that too. Let's do this and let's do, you know, and then it's like, you can't do that. Like funding wise and like, you know, bandwidth wise, I don't know, it's sort of boring. It starts to veer into nonprofit um, management. <laughs> Um, sorry, I promise this will be the last book nerd question. This is when I forgot. Actually, I don't promise. There might be more book nerd questions coming up. Um, this was one I wanted to ask earlier, but are there, are there um, all time most or least popular titles that off the top of your head you think of? Uh, you know, I just think like Louis L'Amour is reliably two thumbs up. I've used, I've used the lure of a Louis to pull a patron who's walked around me for like a year. And finally they're like, okay, you know, maybe I will check out a book from you. You know, um, I feel like, uh, man, I just, um, James Patterson is popular. I feel like, um, but I feel like everything is popular when we've established a, a cool relationship with people. Like, like the guy who reads only Louis L'Amour 
one day when there's no Louis L'Amour, maybe is sort of talked into Cormac McCarthy, all the pretty horses. Like that's a Western, it's a little bit different. It doesn't use quotation marks, but otherwise you should be all set. You know, so I mean, there's that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and just again, like such a wide diversity of um, authors and titles that people have been interested in. It's pretty cool. And it's very um, often that we encounter people who are better read in a certain vein or a certain genre than we are. And that's great. You know, we've had a, some very cool interactions with people who schooled us, including Hodge uh, with Woodhouse very early on in my own um, experience, you know. I think that's my, my number one fear of being involved with any kind of library system is that I'll make a horrible recommendation. I'll be like, oh, you like the stand? Here's Gravity's Rainbow. It's pretty well, this, you, you're gonna love this. And I have nightmares about that. Um, I've asked about the high points. I wanna ask about the low points. Were there any moments over the course of the project uh, where you wanted to give up, where you wanted to, to quit either for financial reasons or just the work was too hard or it felt too, like too uphill a slog? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like uh, this line of work, I think burnout is high and it's because it's very hard to draw good boundaries when you see people suffering. Um, we have an incredible team of street librarians, administrator, you know, admin team and, um, and board. And I think that that is, is a reason we've been able to stay steady and um, take care of each other. But I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I've, had, I've, I've witnessed some very bleak stuff. I think the pandemic, everyone struggled with the pandemic. And I think I was helped in a weird way uh, by having a home and then having my, my work be outside. And so I saw what our patrons experienced, the level of outsiderness when there were no community rooms open, no more Multnomah County Library where they could sit and read a newspaper. Um, and that was so striking. One of the things that I think I mentioned this to you the other day when we talked, I thought a lot about this because I think during the pandemic, my family and I, our two teenagers, got addicted for a period of time to Alone, the series where, you know, intrepid individuals are dropped off in really wild places in British Columbia. They can choose 10 items, tools like a fishing net, a knife, whatever. And then they have to stick it for as long as they can. The one that lasts the longest is, gets $500,000 or something. And we watched that and we watched the narrative around each character build and we watched their grimy hands as they demonstrated some little tool they'd invented. And I was just struck by how we love that. And as a culture, we watch that and we trail, we, tr you know, we tune in um, to see grit and resilience and to see these people um, survive, but we, we only love that in certain contexts. And if it happens to be happening on our block, if there's an in encampment, even if it's got a pretty unique uh, construction or something, that's different. And so I thought a lot about that too, like how we assign value uh, to some people, but it doesn't you know, extend to everyone. So yeah, anyway, just a thought. I can't even remember what the, the question was. <laughs> no, that was an incredibly profound point. I was uh, when when you, we were talking about that. I mean, it, it, it had never struck me in those terms before, this idea of with the privilege of sort of comforting distance and comforting context and the sort of the veneer, um, this thing can become exciting and, and sort of, you know, and, and how, how quickly that vanishes mm -hmm. immediately when, when you take the veneer away. Um, and yeah, I've been thinking about it ever since. Um, Okay, I don't. I, we, we, the questions are piling up, and I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to monopolize. Um, so uh, there's there's some dot dot dots. So I'm not going to get everybody's full names. But Peter was asking, um, houseless campers all have amazing stories. Would you consider another book with stories from many people you've met on your own uh, on your travels with street books? Uh, I do love the interaction between you and Ben. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was um, I was telling my parents the other day about, um, about the people that I'd met that were real advocates and they managed to do this work outside. You know, they were living in an encampment and they were, they were creating amazing change. And my mom said, there's another book. And so I think that there are, and you know, Portland, you may have noticed is stocked full of writers. And so I would throw this out to the, the, everyone in attendance that that, 
These are um, stories that are unfolding, stories that need captured, relationships that need, um, you know, forged. And so, yeah, I, I would say 100%. I think that there, um, there are people writing their own stories and we need to make sure that they've got a, a way to type them, you know, or to capture them. Um, ben, who is definitely not a plant, has put, the, has put the following question in. Love the book. I'm interested in hearing what you're working on next. <laughs> I'm afraid that's Ben Parzibach, my husband, who is downstairs. Um, you know, that's a very fun thing. I was working on a novel. I'd made some pretty good headway into it when I did the three-month art project for Street Books. And, um, and I set that book aside. Um, and I'm, I've been thinking a lot about it. I haven't um, fully picked it up again and, and dump, you know, dived into it. But um, yeah, I would just say there's a work in progress, but I, I won't um, go too deep, deep into it. It's exciting though. It's exciting to have um, something in mind, something that's kind of sparking. This is one of, one of the things I have learned one of the rules from my from my very short career as a as a novelist is that you never you never leave evidence of what you're where you don't want you because they're going to archive this thing and then you're going to be held held accountable right. you don't we don't want to ever put specific um there's a couple of questions here that i'm going to sort of combine into into one and they have to do with sort of um how you first went about forming the collaboration with ben and how did you know that you would be friends, that you would be able to be co-authors, that you would sort of be able to get this project going? Well, you know, it's interesting, I think, um, and this is why I wish Hodge were here to like contradict or, um, or confirm anything that I say. Um, I feel like I, we had a real connection from that very first summer um, at Skidmore Fountain and I, I really looked forward to him coming. And so I think I talk about that a little bit in the book. When he disappeared, um, I was concerned and I kind of looked for him and I realized that nah, that's probably not good because I, I, um, I don't have favorites. You know, I'm a librarian. I'm just gonna serve all my patrons. But, but I feel like um, ours was a pretty organic friendship. And when we started to meet regularly, it was because I knew I could trust him. I didn't have ever, any sense ever that um, it wouldn't be okay to, to um, meet for a coffee with him. And I eventually, and this is something we talk about in the book, I go to his campsite and he cooks me a fish dinner. And I think that that represented years of knowing him by then and um, you know, confidence that we had a true bond. And so I, I remember early on giving him a pen and a little notebook that very first summer when he mentioned that he wrote and that he, you know, and, and, and some of the stuff he was telling me was so funny and so great. And so I feel like early on, we had almost immediately a conversation in that vein. And so it didn't feel at all odd to say, let's say we hatch a scheme together, you know? I mean, it was just very organic and, um, and he's an incredible writer and, a, you know, an incredible, mind. And so I'm so excited that that was kind of captured in part in this book, you know. Um, if you're not comfortable answering on his behalf, by all means don't, but I'm just wondering what his reaction has been to sort of seeing the finished product, seeing it on bookshelves. What, what has that reaction been? Oh, it's so cool. I mean, he just sent a copy to his grandson and, you know, his grandkids are mentioned in this book and his daughter. Um, you know, I think early on we had a conversation and he was like, Laura, you seem to be handling this fame really well. And I said, I, th I think it's pretty moderate fame, Hodge. I don't think we have to worry too much. And he said, no, no, you, you know, like look at Tennessee Williams in the Glass Menagerie. Like he didn't even know who his friends were. And there was this uh, interesting kind of um, line of thinking he'd been in. And I realized that, um, you know, this is a process we'll, we'll go through together. Um, and, and there are probably things we, did not see coming um, that we'll that we'll sort through, but I think that um, I think it's been a pretty cool experience for him to be able to share that with his family, you know, um, and with his friends. And you know, he's made the rounds and distributed a number of these books at encampments, at um, Foster Foosball on on uh, Foster to you know friends at the bar and. 
So I think that this has been an interesting, um, this book has traveled very interesting places even in the distribution, you know, the story of it coming together is interesting to me, but then what happens next and the, the places it travels, I think will be, will be really interesting. And I, it's just finding patrons, seeking them out and thanking them and giving them a copy has been one of the coolest things I can imagine, you know, it's, and they're just so excited for us and so thrilled if they happen to be documented in the pages, you know, that's been such a cool thing. There's a, there's a question from the audience about um, whether the library was was active during the pandemic, and I'm also wondering sort of if what, how different that is. What are, what are the challenges of operating uh, during this this mess that we're in? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, right away, um, two of our most scrappy and intrepid librarians, Sophie and Diana, uh, just commenced doing the same thing they had been doing but with masks on, distributing masks, distributing hand sanitizer along with the books. And I feel like um, it was a little bit crushing the adjustment we had to make because one of the best things is creating that intersection in the city and then having people come and gather. I mean, that's the whole point is that you can lure people into being part of a community, but of course you can't do that easily and comfortably in a global pandemic. And so we had to make sure people were masked. We, for a time, we did not take the bikes out, the bike libraries that would gather people. Librarians went on their own bikes um, and just greeted people one-to-one. -one. And at a distance, we had small boxes and they showed the spines of titles or, I mean, that was an, another interesting thing. We took tons of requests from people. So we had mini quests every week. Like I've got to get this coloring book to this person in the park blocks. I've got to get this to the old town village. Um, and so that has been, uh, you know, that's a, that's an adaptation we had to do. The other thing that's been pretty cool about the pandemic is we had to figure out how to um, reach as many people as we could with a new set of constraints. And it seemed like the work was hard before, but this was like, you know, extra difficult, but we also forged um, partnerships with organizations we just would not have otherwise. And we we established a library liaison um, program at each encampment, um, each of the villages in, in Portland, where one person that lived at the village would text us requests. And so we had a very regular delivery system there. And that was also, a, you know, we were able to do that uh, at a careful distance. Um, yeah, so we've adapted and you know, I mean, we we're just kind of used to the masks. It's pretty weird and it's not as great, but everyone, you know, knows that by now. So mm -hmm. there's a question um, from somebody who I believe uh, is part of a, another street books operation. Um, sorry, the, the name is cutting out with dot, 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 but I'm pretty sure that's uh, the person asking this, but uh, they're asking uh, as a small nonprofit, can you speak about the competitive aspect of fundraising against larger organizations? Yeah, that's probably Patrick. And I want to give a shout out to Patrick Crowley, who founded his own street library in Austin, Texas. So he's streetbooksatx.org. You can find it there. Um, and we were able to go visit Patrick and, um, and be part of the Texas Book Festival a couple of years ago. But I would say that's kind of the unsavory part of um, a nonprofit you know, industrial complex is keeping yourself funded. And there have been times when I've thought, like, why do I have to document the number of um, black and brown people we just served today or the number of trans folks? Like, like I'm not going to ask someone to have a picture taken unless they're part of the team and very, you know, I, I feel like uh, like there, there are a lot of unsavory parts to, to fundraising. I will say in our with street books, we have not ever gotten giant and unwieldy with funding. We don't have fancy letterhead. We have pretty great teal colored t-shirts, but that's like the, the ed. We did get hoodies one year. So, uh, but, but I would say we have an annual fall event in a non-pandemic time that is the best. It's in person. It's all of our patrons who are able to make it. They come and they eat free, sponsored by um, donors and community um, who buy extra tickets on their behalf. Um, and it's many people dining together that would never be hanging out and dining together usually. Um, and then we, off, we, we have a little bit of a fundraiser on the side. So 
um, I don't know with regard to fundraising, if that is you, Patrick, I just, I feel you, I feel your pain. That part sucks. If it turns out in a few years that this was all like a breaking bad type money laundering operation run through hoodies, there's just like your basement is just stacked with hoodies that you've been. Um, <laughs> um, it's a good idea, Omar. Yeah, sure, sure. Pin it on me now so they have evidence uh, afterwards in the court case. Um, do you find that some of your pa patrons uh, migrated during the pandemic? Were the patterns of movement different? Yeah, I mean, I think that sometimes, I think people were able to get inside in some cases and we, we heard about that. That's always a really exciting update, you know, when people go in. Um, I think people, some people reconnected with family and um, weren't in Portland anymore, which was great. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that continued to happen without our, our being able to see, you know, we only, we only got updates from the people that were still coming to the library or that would seek us out. So, so I know that that happened. I don't know numbers or real specifics, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was another question about whether um, the, the library connects with street routes in any way or some sort of trying to give um, folks a voice. And I'm wondering also just more generally whether there's been other programs, other initiatives that you found have worked really well in tandem or that you've managed to collaborate with. Yeah, I love, and we're such fans of street routes and we're longtime partners. We've, we've been stocking their little shelves inside their office with books for a long time. But Hodge and I owe them because we published early excerpts from what is now a book um, in, in, I think it was 2014 in a Street Roots uh, um, issue. And in fact, that was what uh, caused Hodge's niece to know where he was and that he was okay when she read that. And she actually reached out to me and wrote a, a thank you letter. And so th that's a good example of the way it's connected, but but Street Roots, you know, the, the journalism that they're doing, the, the journalism they did under Israel Bayer and now Kaya Sand is just um, so stellar and so sharp. And they've been able to help guide city policy. And it's as simple as buying a newspaper from a vendor outside um, a space, outside a store or a library. So um, I would really encourage people to support Street Roots and to look for them, um, look for vendors, because that has been great. Um, Sisters of the Road is another partner, um, Blanche House as well, lots of partners that I'm going to forget, but, but those are people and places that have been doing the work forever and that we have been able to combine forces with, you know, and, and collaborate with. So, yeah, it's been very cool. There's a quick question from uh, Janet asking, um, who says that when she was reading um, Loner's she was thinking about um, Woman of Troublesome Creek and is wondering if you have ever read this book. Oh man, I haven't. And that's a good, you know, I'm gonna write it down right now. Yeah, good question. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for outing me on a public forum. Just kidding. Those are always the, I, I get those questions of have you read and I, I always want to lie and say yes. As long as you have no follow-up questions, yes, I have read that book. It was great or terrible or whatever you think it is. Oh, well, and I will say thank you for that question, first of all. And I'm pretty sure, and maybe she can weigh in on the chat, that's the story of Appalachian librarians on horseback um, delivering books, right? Town to town, little dusty town to town. Anyway, someone left that on my porch like a week ago. So I'm starting to feel a little bit. Um, yes, okay, good, yeah. So Janet says yes, yeah. Um, oh man, we, we have four minutes left. Um, I just, uh, I guess I will monopolize two of those four minutes uh, and just say that um, it's, first of all, it was a pleasure doing this. Uh, it was a pleasure reading this book. There's very few like it um, that offer this perspective, that speak this honestly, that are this much fun to read. Um, if you haven't picked this book up, please do. I believe it's a staff pick at Powell's right now. Um, and in addition, Laura, thank you so much for the work that you do and the work that you've been doing largely with no thanks uh, for years and years and years. Uh, I am blurbed somewhere here as calling this one of the best ideas in this town. I stand by that. Um, 
it is it has made this place better. And as someone who lives here, I'm deeply grateful for that. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for coming out to this. I really do appreciate it. Laura, I will leave the last word to you. As Kevin comes in, I will immediately cut him off. Uh, and say, Laura. <laughs> Uh, I'll just say I want to thank Omar so much for this conversation, for the great the great questions, and just really um, recommend that you go out and buy Omar's books. What Strange Paradise is the most recent, and American War. And I I, I think there's a lot of interesting overlap uh, with our two projects because it's very much about people searching for a home and a, a you know a, a sense of belonging and a community. And so. Um, yeah, I, I just am so honored that we managed to get you for this conversation and so grateful. Thanks to, to Kevin and to Powell's and for everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. It's such a great uh, event. Lots of people watching, lots of comments. Uh, speaking of the comments in the chat box, I just posted the link to loners one more time. So click on that so you can buy it from us and support us. Um, this is what it looks like, by the way. It's a beautiful book. I agree with Omar. I think it's one of the best, one of the most important books uh, to come out of Portland in the hey, past Kevin? few years. Yeah. This I'm sorry. To, I'm really sorry to cut in one more time, but I just have to do a shout out to Aaron uh, Robert Miller, who did the cover. There is a real significance in this cover that people should study, but then he also did the beautiful art um, inside the book. And that was him um, listening, reading the book, listening to Hodge and me, riding his bike to these places in Portland, capturing them in his sketchbook. And so we're so, so grateful that, that uh, he was able to do the art for us, so. That's great. And uh, this is published by Perfect Day Publishing here in Portland, one of the great um, parts of the literary community here in Portland. There's Omar's book, by the way, too. Congratulations again on the Giller. Uh, shortlist, Omar. And uh, let's see what else. Uh, you can watch this uh, event again tomorrow on our YouTube page. And I am going to click, or I'm going to paste in our YouTube page um, link here into the chat. If anyone missed it, or if you want to tell your friends about it, check out our YouTube page and you can watch this all over again tomorrow. Um, so great. I think we could talk for a long, long time about this book and, and the importance of it and um, all the issues that you talk about in it and all the, the lives and, and human humanity of it. It's really beautiful. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Laura, Omar, and everyone have a good night. Thank you.